Well, there is a, um, a trait. I want to see if you can guess what I'm talking about. I guess you can call it a trait. Uh, it's a trait that makes people very attractive. I'll be more specific. It's a trait that's indispensable in any human relationship with another. You know what I'm talking about? It's a trait that if you use this, you will make someone feel very important and very special. It's a trait that if you do this, you will show yourself bearing spiritual fruit. We're going to hear that word a lot today. Patience, self-control, and love. It's a trait that we can all grow in, but it's also a trait that all of us can attain. And it really doesn't take a lot of work. What am I talking about? What's that? Listening. Very good. There is so much information in our society about how to be a good speaker. There's almost nothing about how to be a good listener. We spend a part of one of our four sessions when I do premarital counseling, not just on how to communicate, to talk, but how to listen, which is part of communication. Listening implies you care about what someone else is saying. That is love. Listening implies that you do not have all the answers, and what someone is saying might help you grow as a person. That is humility. Pride people do not listen. Unloving, selfish people do not listen. Listening is an indispensable component if you wish to be a mature believer and a successful person. There's an art to listening. Maybe I should preach a whole sermon on that. Eye contact. Body language. Minimizing distractions so you can focus all your attention on what the person is saying, not interrupting them. Understanding clarifying comments and summarizing comments. Taking notes if applicable. The Bible's got a lot to say about listening because it's important. James 1, but everyone must be quick to hear and slow to what? Speak. Ecclesiastes 3, there's a point in time for everything, a time to be silent and a time to speak. For some people, all they know is the time to speak. Last week's sermon, chapter 8, verse 8, Jesus would continually call, this, this verse is so cool because I, you always view it like he says it once. It says he was continually calling this out. So he's teaching and he kept saying this over and over again as he's teaching. He who has ears, let him what? Hear. Hearing, it's all over last week's section. The word hear, verse 8, two times, and verse 13. The word hearing, verse 10. The word heard, verses 12, 14, and 15. It's in the Word of God. And then I get to verses 16 and 21, and I look at it on Tuesday morning as I begin to enter into my sermon preparation, and I say, what am I going to say about this? What am I going to say? They just seem like disjointed thoughts. And I read them through, and I read them through, and I read them through, and I said, you know what? It is in the context of the four soils. It's all about listening and knowing whether or not you're truly listening to God's word. Verse 18, so take care how you listen. There it is again. Verse 21, my mother and brothers are those who hear The Word of God, again, listening. Our time is limited this morning, but I'd like to talk about the topic of listening to God's Word. And we're going to have four sub-points. You see those in your sermon outline. The four sub-points will support the main point, and the purpose of the four sub-points is for you personally to determine whether or not you are listening to God's Word. The four ways that I list you for you there are how you can know if you are listening to God's Word. The main point is right there in the title. Are you listening? So let me give you the the big line right now. I'm not going to work to a conclusion. I'm going to give you the conclusion right now. Here's the conclusion. How do you know you're listening to God's word? What do you think? How do you know? Very good. You're going to apply it. You're going to do it. That was last week's sermon. The Christian or the good soil, the four soil, will hear God's word, will grow, and will produce spiritual 
Fruit, implication, you're applying God's word. Or we see it right here in verse 21. Main point of this section, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God, listen, and do it. Okay, let's support that now with the four subpoints. Here we go, first subpoint. True listeners will live reflectively. Let me explain what that means, reflectively. When you think of a reflection, what comes to mind? Maybe a mirror? And what I mean by that is, if you are a true believer bearing fruit for Jesus, people will see you and you will reflect Jesus Christ. You will show Jesus. Your life will show, will reflect Christ through your actions and through your words. Look at verse 16. No one after lighting a lamp covers it with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so those who come in may see the light. Boy, guys, three weeks, this is your third parable you're getting now, right? And a parable is an earthly story to convey a spiritual meaning. Well, this one's fairly simple. I mean, anyone can figure out the earthly story, right? There's no electricity back then. So they had to have light. Well, how do you have a light when there's no electricity? You, you, you got your, uh, your lamp. It was like a, a, a elliptical-shaped container, maybe made out of uh, clay. And it had a little wick in it. And it was filled with an, an oil. And, and you would light the wick, and it had a handle on the backside, and you'd carry it around. I mean, what do we do when the lights go out? We get a flashlight. They didn't have flashlights back then. What do we do when we don't have flashlights? You light a candle. Very simple, controlled fire. And it goes without saying, if you look there at verse 16, that you're not going to light a lamp with the intention of wanting light and then cover it. You're like, it's dark in here. Okay, let me light a candle. And then I put it inside this box. You're like, what'd you just do? That made no sense. I'm not going to put it, as verse 16 says, under a bed. I mean, they slept on pallets. They also slept on straw. You can imagine if you put a lit candle under a straw bed, you're going to set, you're going to set yourself on fire, right? You don't do that. No, what do you do? You don't put it on the floor. You put it on a lampstand. You put it on a lampstand so that it will serve its greatest function. What does it mean now from a spiritual perspective? I think this one's pretty easy to follow. Who dwells within you if you are a true believer? Jesus. In the context, Jesus called himself what? The light of the world. If, just being logical here, if the light of the world dwells in you, it only stands to reason that the light of the world will shine through you, right? As you have been illumined by Christ, it's only natural to say that Christ will illuminate others through you. For you not to share Jesus is the same absurdity to light a lamp and put it under a container. Jesus is in me, but I just got it. I got him closed off. That makes no sense. Or if you want to put it in today's way of thinking, it's like, you know, nowadays, and it's like five o'clock and it's dark outside already, right? And you go upstairs and you have dinner at, let's say, five, and you go up and you want to do some reading in your room and it's pitch black up there by six. What do you do? You, you got to turn on lights. And you turn on the lights to do some reading, but the moment you turn the lights and you go up there and you, you unscrew all the light bulbs. I mean, you're like, that's just foolishness. That's, that's ridiculous. It's absurdity. It's senseless. It's without purpose. I need some lights so I can do some reading, so I unscrew all the light bulbs. That's what Jesus is getting at. The light in the world dwells in you. You're going to share Jesus with other people. He's going to shine through you. You don't put a container over Jesus. Philippians 2, so that you will prove yourself to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom, catch this, you appear as lights in the world. Hear that? Holding fast the word of life. Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. Ephesians 5, 8, you were formerly in darkness, but now you are what? Light in the Lord. Stay with me on this progression. Bottom line. If you're truly hearing Christ's word, that's what we're talking about here. If you're truly hearing it, you will obey it. If you obey Christ's word, 
you will become more like Christ. And the more you come like Christ, the more you'll be able to show Christ by your actions. And actions are essential. But you're not going to be sharing the gospel if you don't use words as well. Here's what always gets me. If I call myself a Christian, and I say, I believe the gospel. Christ died for my sins. And the only hope I have is if I give my life to Christ, who is the only one that took away sin, and he's the only one that forgives. And if I believe him by faith, God will grant me eternal life and forgiveness and hope in heaven. If I believe that, and I'm not sharing the gospel with those around me, there's only two conclusions, folks, that I can come up with. Either I really don't believe it, because I'm just, it's a game, it's a lie, it's, it's a fairy tale. I'm not going to share that with someone else. Or I believe it, they're on the road to eternal hell, and I simply don't care. Folks, those are, those are two pretty nasty conclusions. You see, that's why Jesus gives this so clearly. You'll hear the word, you'll bear fruit. One of those fruits is to allow the light of Christ in you to come out of you to share Jesus with others through your words and actions. That is your purpose. You don't put a container over the light. You don't zip your lips because you don't like to be persecuted. Sometimes I think we love people right to hell. 1 Peter 2.9, you are purpose, you are a chosen race, you are a royal priesthood, you are a holy nation, you are a people for God's own possession, so that, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Second, true listeners hear God's word and live securely, securely. This verse is talking about the insecurity, I believe, of hypocrisy. Last week, soil number one hears God's words and rejects it outright. Hard heart. Last week, soils two and three hear God's word, appear to receive it, but it's not with a good heart, not with a genuine heart. They're never truly saved. Soils two and three are people that call themselves Christians. They're people that might go to church every Sunday. They might even get baptized and be a member of a church. They might, even, they, might have, they might have contributed 45 of these boxes. They might teach in a Christian school. They might do all those things. But the heart was never changed. They're not truly saved. It's not a genuine heart. It's not true fruit that's being born on their branches. They're an imposter. They're a hypocrite. They're a deceiver. They're deceiving everybody else. And maybe, folks, ready for this? They're even deceiving themselves. They may think they're part of God's family, but they're not. That's scary. You've heard a saying before, just because you call yourself a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. Any more than sitting in the garage makes you a car. Or hanging out at Dunkin' Donuts makes you a donut. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. Had a guy come up to me on, fr on Friday, um, and I said, listen, I'm going to say what you just said to me to the whole church on Sunday, but realize it was in my notes before you said it to me, okay? Just realize that, so I'm not picking on you. Um, a month ago, we had the Harvest Festival, okay? And um, I was John Bunyan, as you know, at the very end, last station. He said to me, he goes, I thought the real John Bunyan was going to be there. He said that. I shared the second service, not my notes either. I came out of my office that Friday for the Harvest Festival, and I start walking down this sidewalk to go to the field, right? And a car pulls up right in front of me. And I, I like, I'm going to fake out this, this person. And I go into my John Bunyan walk, my old man walk. You know, I got the gray, remember the gray hair, bald head. And I do this. It's Lou Brancadora, our buddy Lou. And Lou turns around, he looks at me, he's like, how you doing, sir? And he keeps going. <laughs> I faked out Big Lou. And I'm like, I got to at least let him know. So I yell, I go, 
Big Lou. And he, everyone knows my voice, you know. And he's like, oh, Pastor Randy, I didn't know that was you. I faked him out. He said, why are you sharing this? Because I could go down that field. I could, I'm not a good actor, but I could try to act like John Bunny, and I could try to look like John Bunny with all the clothes I bought at the a Goodwill store. I could, um, ev- I could try to talk like John Bunyan. I could try to act like John Bunyan. I might even think I'm John Bunyan, but the bottom line is I'm not John Bunyan of the 16th century. That's not me. doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what other people think about me. I'm not John Bunyan. Just even though I looked apart, I'm not him. You say, are you telling me that people that think they're Christians could end up going to hell? Yes. Matthew chapter 7, on that day, on judgment day, many will come up to me and say, Lord, Lord, and what's Jesus going to say? I never knew you. Yeah, that is frightening, folks. You're never even part of the family. This is soils two and three. Now, what I've seen in ministry is oftentimes soils two and three will fall away within time. They don't make it to judgment day. They're coming out and they're here every week and things are great. And then all of a sudden they're out every three weeks. And then they're, uh, you know, out every one, twice a month. And then they're dropping out of ministry. And they, they, just, they just drift away. That's usually what happens. You say, disciples drift away from Jesus? Yeah. I was reading John 6. As a result of this, Jesus had some tough teaching. Many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. It only showed they were never his disciples to start with. Phonies, imposters. And some live that way their entire life until they die. Kids that grow up in Christian homes need to be hearing this. They fool everybody. They might even fool themselves. But there's one person they're not going to fool. Who is that? The Lord. Because he knows the heart. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. And there will come a time when each one of us will have to stand before the Lord. And there's no fool in him. On that day, verse 17, everything will become evident. All things will be, verse 17, known and come to light. There's going to be a day of reckoning. And I think a lot of people are going to be surprised. That, to me, is frightening. As a shepherd of the church, this scares me to death. Two chapters earlier in Luke, our Lord said this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do what I say? What followed that? The very next verse. Everyone who comes to me and hears these words and acts upon them, I will show you what he's like. He's like a man who builds a house and he laid a foundation on the rock. This is the security. If you are hearing God's word and you have a desire and ability to live it out, I did not say to perfection, none of us do, but the desire and ability is there and you delight in, be- in, in doing God's word, and you see God bearing attitude and action fruit, last week's sermon in you, you have security. God wants you to know that you're saved. But if that's not happening, you have no assurance of your salvation. I say that because I care about you and love you. I want you to know for certain, just as John said in his epistle, that you have eternal life. Are you hearing God's word, and are you applying it, folks? So important. Assured of our eternal destiny. Following verse 15 with a good heart. There it is. A good heart. Do you have a good heart? All right, third test. True believers will bear spiritual fruit. Third test. True believers will bear spiritual fruit. Last week we learned that the only plants that grew and bore any spiritual fruit were the ones in the good soil, the fourth soil, and they gave evidence that they were a good plant because they produced fruit. Is there spiritual fruit in your life that gives evidence that God is working through you? Are you hearing God's word and applying it? Are you living fruitfully? Third point. Look at verse 18. So take care how you listen. There it is again. Whoever has, listen, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he, what? This is such a good word here. Thinks. It's all in his mind will be taken away from him. Now, what does that mean? I guess just keep it in context, what we've been covering. True listeners, listen, hear, good heart, they obey, produces fruit. How much fruit? How much fruit, verse 
8. What does it say? What does it say? A hundredfold. Remember I told you last week, 15-fold was a great crop. A hundredfold. You look at Matthew, I think it's what, 30, 60, 100. There's different degrees and different amounts, but there's fruit that's, that's just multiplying, multiplying. Every year, more fruit keeps coming. Legitimate fruit. God produced fruit. Increasing of fruit. But the imposter, hypocrites, they appear to bear fruit. They think, there's the word, they think they got fruit. At, athletics were like, it's almost like when you say, like, he thinks he's got game, but he's really not that good. <laughs> he thinks he's good, but he can't guard anybody. He thinks he's a good quarterback, but man, he, 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 he couldn't hit that wall with a football if you asked him to. But in his mind, he thinks he's great. I used to love the first day of football practice where we would tell the kids, especially when I coach like freshman and junior high, we'd tell the kids, all right, here's all the positions on the football team. Here's all 11 on offense, 11. Go stand where you think you might want to play. And you look at some of these kids that go like quarterback, and you're like, um, maybe that's not the position for you. Let's put you up here at guard. I think that's going to be more appropriate. We'll give you a shot though. But in their mind, they think they can do it. And there's a lot of Christians that think they got a lot of legitimate fruit, but it's all in their head. It's not God-produced fruit. It's fake fruit. It's synthetic fruit. It's artificial fruit. It's man-made fruit that they are tying to the branches. My grandma used to have in her uh, living room a bowl of fruit. Silver Ridge Park in Tom's River, 1970s. You're going, oh, grandma, look at the apple. Oh, wait, that's not an apple. That's a fake apple. It was wax. Remember those days? Wax fruit. Fake wax fruit. There's a lot of people that think they're producing fruit, but they're just tying wax fruit to the branches. And what this verse is saying, that eventually God's going to say, all right, that's enough of that. I'm just going to clear it out. I'm going to take it away. And to the ones that are producing my fruit, they're going to keep producing more. They're going to become more mature in Christ and more beautiful as they grow. And those that have the fake fruit, I'm just going to clear it out. Kind of like pruning the dead branches in John 15, right? I'm just going to chop them off. Let me see if I can give you an illustration. This is what came to mind this week. So, um, uh, let's see. How do I start? Uh, about 12 years ago, maybe a little more than that even, I took my daughter on a national park trip. Okay? I've shared this with you a couple times. Okay? And uh, we had a great time. So I'm like, this is going to be a cool thing. I'm going to take like a daddy-daughter trips and maybe occasionally we can do it, a whole family trip and my wife and I trip. And we just kept going to national parks now for like the last 12 years. And I've been to like many of them. <laughs> Okay, and I got it where I can set it up where I can basically do it all for free now. And um, it started going real well. And uh, then someone said, you know, maybe you should do uh, uh, videos. Someone suggested that. I'm like, that's a cool idea. And I'm like, yeah, I'll do videos. And then I got some video editing software. And I'm like, this is fun. I just love it. I love to edit videos. It's, it's free. It's kind of what I can do late at night when everybody's sleeping. And, you know, I don't watch TV. And I, I don't, I'm not a movie guy. I'm like... This is fun. And then I put them on a YouTube channel. So I started a little YouTube channel. And again, the goal was just for fun, to share it with people that I know and uh, to have something there that would be permanent, in a sense, for my children to watch years down the line. They're there right there. They can get on their phone and they can watch any video they want. And, and over the time, I mean, I got like 160 videos up already or something like that. And three years later, this channel, in the first year, I got 100 subscribers. And by the second Christmas, because that's when I started it, I'm up to 300 subscribers. Now I'm up to 2,300 subscribers. It's like, it's just like, takes off. I didn't intend that. I didn't expect that. A quarter million views on my ridiculous National Park videos. America's Parks on YouTube. You can check it out. But the people... And you can say they're ridiculous videos too when you get done watching them. But the people that watch it are people that like my work. I mean, I'm not, other than that little cheap promotion right there, I'm not running around, you know, promoting it in the sense, you know. It just, it's out there and people are finding it as they're doing 
searches and they like it and there I'm getting to meet people from all over the world. I'm sharing the gospel with them. I'm developing new friends and relationships. It's just been good. It's been really good. It's been fun. It's been healthy. It's been good. But I've learned in the YouTube community, it's very interesting, that many people who have YouTube channels find their identity in their YouTube channel. It's like a pastor who finds his identity in the size of his church. You know, you get together with the pastors. How big's your church? How big's your church? And the guy that says, "Oh, I've, I got ten thousand at my church," everybody's like, "Ooh, wow!" And the guy's like, "I got seventy at my church." You're like, "Oh, well, maybe someday you'll grow up to be as important as us." It doesn't work that way, folks. God's never going to hold me accountable on Judgment Day to how many people come to the church. A lot of pastors of seventy-person churches that are going to do a lot better than some guys that probably have ten thousand-person churches. My identity is not in my YouTube channel. My identity is not my ministry. It's not my YouTube channel especially. That's just a hobby. But for many people who do not have Christ, that is their identity. And it all comes down to how many subscribers do you have? And how many views do you have? And people that have like 100 subscribers, they feel like losers in the community. So what do you do? You get desperate. You start buying subscribers. I'm serious on that. You can Google it, it's there. You can, like, 50 bucks, and all of a sudden your subscribers go from 100 to 200, like that. You're like, I need more views. What do you do? Ah, oh, you put it on your cell phone, and every day while you're working, you just got on autoplay, and it's just racking up the views. Because my identity is in my channel. And the bigger the channel, the more special I am. The more people respect me. The more worth I have. The more important I feel. But it's fake. It's fake fruit. The YouTube computer is very, very, I don't know what to call it. It's not the algorithm. It's just the computer system in it. Very smart. And the YouTube system does not like phonies. And they got a way to send these little spiders out through your channels. And they'll can determine how many of these views are real views and how many of these views are artificial views. And they will strip all those artificial views away. And your view count might have 100,000. All of a sudden you look at it one day and it's got 20,000. What just happened? You had 80,000 fake views. Or subscribers. You got a bunch, and all of a sudden, they're gone. But it gets worse than that. See, the way the system works is your channel gets successful as it gets promoted. Who promotes it? The computer promotes it. You're, you're on a channel, and then you look over, and there's all these suggestions. You want your channel to get suggested. YouTube says, you're a bad guy. We're not going to suggest your channel anymore. And tell you what, if you do something real bad, we'll give you a copyright strike. If you do something real bad after that, we're just going to shut down your channel and cancel it. And you're done. You do it the right way, you get legitimate fruit. Do it the wrong way, the fake fruit is taken away. Same applies to God. All right, we've got to wrap it up here. Number four, non-listeners. Non-listeners. Number one, do not share Christ to produce fruit in other people. Non-listeners, number two, are hypocrites, and eventually the fruitless weed will be revealed. Number three, non-listeners have false fruit that will be taken away, our last point. And now number four, non-listeners will show they never had any desire to bear fruit in the first place because they cared very little about obeying God's word. Verses 19 and 21, here we go. And his mother and brothers came to him, came to Jesus, and they were unable to get to him because of the crowd has reported your mother and your brothers, by the way, brothers, that shows that Mary was not a perpetual virgin, by the way. We're standing outside to see these be half brothers. But Jesus answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. I've got a question for you. Last week's sermon. Did the first soil hear the word of God? It's kind of a trick question. If you're following with me, you're going to say no. But according to the verse, if you just look at it, the answer is yes. Look at verse 12. They heard the word of God. Second soil, did they hear the word of God? Verse 13, they hear the word of God. Third soil, verse 14, those who heard the word of God. All four soils heard the word. But only one soil produced results. The other three, there was no results. 
The four soil heard, verse 15, the word of God. With what? Look at it. An honest and good heart. They held fast to the word. As a result, they and only they produced fruit. According to this parable, that's the only person that's truly saved. They can rightfully call him or herself a Christian. James 1.22, but prove yourself doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. So our Lord's family can't get to him. Verse 19, why? The crowds. He is at this point at the zenith of his popularity. That's all going to change, as you know, on, cruci- on the uh, Passion Week. They're all going to want him crucified. But right now, man, it is the Jesus show. Pharisees hate him, but everybody else is kind of like following him everywhere. Family comes. They're trying to get to see Jesus. They come in. Hey, your mom, your brothers are outside. Verse 20, what does he say? Verse 21, my true family are those who hear the word of God and do it. Those, those are my true family. I don't so much about biological ties anymore. My family are people that follow me. So what's your attitude toward God? Your attitude toward God is directly related, listen, to how well you hear and follow the word of God, the Bible. You cannot have a relationship with anybody, this is common sense, without being a good listener. If you have a relationship with God, you will listen to God. And if you're listening to God, listen, there will be evidence of reproductive fruit, growing fruit, genuine fruit, and healthy fruit. Let me say that again. Reproductive fruit that's reproducing itself, growing fruit, genuine fruit, healthy fruit, true spiritual fruit in your life. Let's pray. Lord, uh, I I hope people know my heart in terms of proclaiming this. My goal is just to teach your word. My identity is not in the church. My identity is in you, Lord. And the one I want to please always is you. And Lord, I feel like there is always in every church people, and I hope there's none in here, and I'm not even intending this message to go to someone in my mind right now that thinks they're saved, but they're not. And maybe they're just faking it because they just like hanging out. Or maybe they think they're saved, but they're not saved. And right now, you would allow them to do some self-examination. We are commanded to do that. That is a healthy exercise. We're always called to do that. Lord, the goal is not to keep doubting, not to be filled with unbelief, not to be filled with wonder. That would be cruel. The goal for you is that we might know for certain, the Scripture says, that we have eternal life. The only way we're going to know that is not a prayer we prayed or an aisle we walked. But if you are truly living in us and there's fruit coming out of us, fruit that's reproductive and fruit that's growing and fruit that's genuine and fruit that's healthy, And for some of us, it might be 30. For some of us, it might be 100-fold. But there's something there. So help us, Lord, to have the confidence, the assurance, and the security that we are your children. For every finger we point to ourselves, help us to point nine to the cross to know that it's not about our goodness, but it's about the grace in Jesus Christ that saves us, that changes a heart, that provides salvation for us, that brings forgiveness and produces the fruit. It's all you through the gospel. Not just a gospel decision, but gospel living. May we, Lord, be used by you to reflect you through our actions. May we be humble, Lord. May we keep our eyes upon you and always the greater good of your church. May we desire to realize this is not our life, but we have died and our life is hidden with Christ in God. May we long for the day that when Christ is revealed, we will be revealed with him also in glory. Encourage us, Lord, with these words and help us always to be listeners who don't just hear and walk away, but listeners that hear and do as you do through us. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.